So I want to now just introduce a concept from Walter Brueggemann on the Psalms, in which he says that the Psalms often include um, orientation, disorientation, and then reorientation. And in the um, orientation, we've looked at orientation so far ourselves in terms of praise and thanksgiving, which can be seen as orientation towards God and the good purposes that he is doing. But then there appear to be passages that are um, disoriented. That is, what happens when things don't go well and central to the Old Testament is the um, disorientation when Babylon take captive the people of God. And that's reflected again with Joseph, disorientation, what happens when Joseph is taken captive. So there's quite a few disorienting passages in the Psalms. So let's have a look now at what Walter Brueggemann says in his book on the Psalms. And he says the Psalms are a puzzle because many of the Psalms are really good, positive. They say God's in control, life will go well. And um, we frequently use them in praise and worship and thanksgiving. And some of the most beautiful poetry depicts moments in the spiritual life when things go well and we celebrate. However, not all is that easy. Consider Psalm 137 by the rivers of Babylon when we sat down and we wept on the willows, we hung up our harps, um, for there our captors asked us for songs and our tormentors asked us for mirth, saying, sing one of your songs of Zion, but how could we sing in a foreign land? O daughter of Babylon, you devastator, happy shall be those who pay back what you have done for us. And so some of you may think, how can I get excited about assignment writing when sometimes I don't get 100% and etc.? Life is filled with these sad, sad moments. Now, it could be part of the educational journey that you need some lower marks at times to realise you've got areas to improve in. But at times you feel a little bit like verse 9. Happy will be those who take little ones, children, and dash them against the rock. That's horrific. We need to edit that out at the Bible. Um, so there are passages in the Bible that are quite challenging, but it shows the freedom and the safe space that the Bible provides for expressing feelings. And so the Bible is saying there is a safe space here for when you feel challenged to express your feelings. And um, psychologists and therapists tell us this as well. When you go in, tell us how you're feeling. Life is tough. My parents pick on me, my children pick on me, my pets even pick on me. You know? Even the goldfish doesn't follow what I want it to be. So um, the Bible... It's not, not very just, politically yes. correct. Was that? It's not very politically correct. <laughs> yes, that's true. The Bible isn't so politically correct in some ways. However, um, um, the Bible, I think, goes beyond the political correct, though, in saying... There is a free, safe space to express yourself. But then it goes on in that it seeks for us to get some sort of reorientation in our lives and settle down because then we have Deuteronomy. And you should think good thoughts, holy thoughts, perfect thoughts, 101% pure and perfect thoughts, etc., is the goal. But along the way, it's okay to admit you haven't got it all together. It's what, what we're finding. So many Christians... Uh, selectively edit their reading of the Psalms and the Bible and forget um, the portions they don't like. And so um, Walter Brueggemann seeks to show that, um, uh, that this is okay. Now, our churches also can fall for this. That is, we could have just a positive philosophy and preaching. Everything will go well in your life. The difficulty with that is that that can happen for five years or so but there will be difficulties in your life. And so the whole of the Bible deals with the whole of life, including the difficulties. And in schools and education, we talk about resilience. What we need is school, uh, students who can't just do well when they're doing well. They need to do well when things are difficult. So if you go to the Olympics and there's um, 1,000 people competing, you have to realise that one will get gold, one will get... Um, uh, silver and one will get bronze 
for 997 people, they're going to have to accept they just didn't make the grade. And so life has these challenging aspects about it, doesn't it? Is that um, uh, it's not all top of the mountain. There are valleys in the journey of life. And the Psalms deal with this. And Walter Brueggemann explains it this way. He says, orientation is a statement of how things could be, how things we'd like uh, to be. And then disorientation is how it can often go wrong. And then reorientation is how we bring it again. So orientation speaks of creation. Genesis 1, God makes the world good. And then we come to the other chapters. Torah is Deuteronomy. God declares this is what it's like when it's good. Wisdom, Proverbs, you'll get blessed when you do the right thing. Narrative, the story, things are starting out well. You're heading on a good journey, education, family, relationships, and psalms of trust. We trust in uh, God. He looks after us. However, the reality of life is that there can be disorientation. That is, there are things in life that will make you angry. There are things in life that will frustrate you. There are things in life that are confusing. There are experiences of God's absence. Communally, people don't treat you well. And individually, life doesn't go so well. And at times, you're going to have to admit it's not just the other people, the log in the other person's eye that's the problem. It's me. And so someone steals my parking spot and I feel some road rage, etc. And the problem is not only in the person who stole my parking spot. The question is, where's my road rage coming from? Why am I getting out there and hitting his car with an object and then regretting it? <laughs> And so hopefully that doesn't happen. <laughs> but there is this disorientation about life. And then even more so, there's a disorientation within us when we feel certain ways about the disorientation. And then the most important thing, says um, Walter Brueggemann, is the reorientation. Things don't just go back to the paradise in the first place. There needs to be growth and development and addressing the problems. So in reorientation, yes, we can give thanksgiving for God being there and being there for us, but God being there and being there for us is teaching us about how we need to deal with the inner problems in our lives, not just make us happy again. He's got to make us more mature. Uh, reorientation, yes, there are hymns of praise. We can praise God, but God's not just giving us the sugary foods. God is also with us as we face challenges and work things through. Reorientation. Yes, God can be at Jerusalem, things going well, but God's there when Babylon marches in and wipes it out. And then in 70 AD, when the Romans march in and wipe it out. So God's with Jerusalem when things don't go so well. The royal Psalms. Yes, God is with the king. But what happens when the King Solomon accidentally marries? 700 other women and such forth and builds an army against God's instruction and gets invaded. And you know. So kings don't always work things out perfectly. How do we handle politics that goes wrong? And then there's um, covenant. God says he'll bless us. And then he says if we obey, and then we admit we don't always obey, but then God says he can renew the covenant if we repent and turn back to him and restore but it's not the same as it was in the first place now we're more mature and grown up so Brueggemann says we hazard when we presuppose a modern use of the psalms God's just going to bless you and skip over the psalms that says there's going to be some challenging steps along the way Brueggemann says orientation disorientation reorientation is part of life for instance, baptism in water. We don't just come out of the water in baptism. We've got to go down there and drown. And, uh, and so there's a disorientation. What are you doing under the water? My sins are being washed away. We've got to admit our sins. And sometimes in churches, they have 10 weeks of meetings where you can reflect on the sins you're um, getting rid of when you get baptized in 10 weeks' time. And so orientation, disorientation, reorientation could be part of water baptism. It's part of what happens when a plant grows. And so I grow annual flowers at home and they bloom and they die. And I can't have them blooming next year. Except that if I look in the center of a dead flower, I'll see there's seed. And if I collect that seed and put it down, 
we'll have a new plant next year. So we've got um, death and rebirth in the seeds and plants all around us. Every night when there's sunset, there'll be a night time, there'll be a sunrise tomorrow. And so life is about the balancing of loss and gift, the end of school, but education goes on, the end of childhood, but life goes on, the end of singleness, and then marriage goes on. And then for some people, marriages come to an end and then they're restarting again. And so there's all sorts of stops and starts in life. And the central story in the Bible is perhaps in 586, God seems to allow the Babylonians to march up and smash down King Solomon's temple and to carry all the people off. And that's pretty sad. How can an all-powerful God allow that to happen? It's central. And then Jesus comes and says in the Gospels, you know, God wants to bless you. Great things are going to happen in your life. Peter says, that's great. Let's build tabernacles and establish God's great purpose. And Jesus says, Peter, you've misunderstood what I'm saying. The temple's really in terms of each person as a temple. And this temple of Jesus has got to go down to the cross and be nailed and die and trusting God to resurrect the dead Jesus. And Peter says, that can't be right, Jesus. You got it wrong. We need to do some talking here, Jesus. And so in Jesus, gospel message is the idea that there can be death and rebirth, but in the rebirth, there's more than there was before the death. So the central gospel message is about this challenge of orientation, good things, disorientation. There's evils and then reorientation. God's wanting to renew that, which gets challenged and make it much, much better than it was in the first place. So before Jesus' death and resurrection, people are building a nation around Jerusalem. They're building a temple. But after Jesus' death and resurrection, we now have the idea that God can be present in every life around the world. And so the temple now is, and the Apostle Paul, he's fighting against Christians. And then in Acts 9, he suddenly gets a vision. Hey, maybe this Jesus thing was right after all. And he says, I think it is. And so he then goes around trying to tell everyone that it's now about God's building the temple of people by his Holy Spirit. Great things can happen. And the last 2,000 years of history has been schools established, hospitals established by this message that God builds. And so orientation, disorientation, reorientation. So let me just have a brief look at um, orientation according to Walter Brueggemann. So firstly, in Genesis chapter 1 or um, uh, Genesis uh, um, Adam and Eve, we've got birth and potential. It's all good. So I'll preach a message now. God's got good purposes. Look at the trees they grow. God's going to grow your life. You'll be blessed. Smile. And then um, creation faith. We trust in God. He sets things in order. He gives us wisdom. So we've got a happy, well-ordered world. No surprises. No fear. You can have faith. Everything's good. Um, you can be faithful. Everything's sound. Uh, there's no chaos because God's going to work it out well. Now, what's the social function of this? The social function of this is that when you go to a church and it preaches that God is faithful, it's going to go well, he's given you wisdom, uh, you read the book of Proverbs, you do the right thing, you attend um, college, you study the subjects, hand in your assignments, put in the good time. That's good, right? Blessed. I went to university with a guy who um, uh, uh, decided he was going to be a doctor. And uh, he showed up for after his first year of study of university for his exams. And the week before he went to his exams, he got, what's the um, fever that you get? Um, and uh, yeah, one, one of these fever things. So he got an illness. Um, it's, the, it's a common one that students will sometimes get people. Shriver. Hey? Yeah, it was like that. Yeah, like so he got that. And anyway, he's wiped out. And uh, so he gets very poor grades. He, he can't get his grades going. So he studied in the science degree with uh, me the next year. But at the end of the next year, they wouldn't let him into medicine either. So he still studied the next year. And so he sweated away, et cetera. So anyway, um, uh, when um, my, one of my children was born, um, who should show up walking along the corridor of the hospital but Dr. Skinner, he had graduated in medicine. And now I think he's quite a famous doctor doing great, wonderful things. 
So there was sort of a, a death and a rebirth thing, wasn't there? And the orientation was he was wanting to go along. So there's a social function in that it's good to have dreams and hopes, but life often gets in the way and we're not all equal and we can all crash and illnesses can get in the way and things can go on this. And so, um, so there's Psalms of Affirmation. So if your church is preaching good Psalms of Affirmation, that's great. Um, however, there is a danger in this view of Psalms of Affirmation, Walter Brueggemann says. Can you see that the danger is that it often um, supports and asserts the status quo and the rights of the privilege? And so I've been down to Sydney University and they've told me just about anyone can go to Sydney University and do brilliantly. Um, a couple of years back, I went to Harvard and a girl from New Zealand told me that she applied to go to Harvard. She got accepted and then she got the bill, 100,000 a year. And she thought that's a bit of a tragedy. Then she had to fill in the application. So this New Zealand girl, um, you know, and, and it said, what's your family background, et cetera. And they said, look, as a New Zealander, we realise you probably don't have much money. We will sponsor you to the tune of 100000 a year and give you a bit of living support. Anyway, she's studying at Harvard, et cetera. And, and they said there, yeah, you know, anyone can study at Harvard. You know, it's open for everyone. But the unfortunate thing is, it's the message of a few for the few, isn't it? And I speak to Americans and they say the American dream is a dream for the few. It's not necessarily the dream for all 300 million Americans. It's, uh, so there's a weakness in this prosperity doctrine, positive doctrine, etc., in that it doesn't, life is not exactly like that. And so the great thing about the Bible and the Psalms is that it doesn't just use the positive message. The positive message may be used for social control. If you study well, you'll all get high distinctions and um, you'll all go on and become medical doctors and uh, your dreams will be fulfilled. Okay. And maybe your parents tell you that. <laughs> but life gets in the way. And so the Bible and the Psalms actually have the, the other side as well. Now, there's four types of um, affirmation. There's the songs of creation. So life is wonderful. Blessings are out there. Psalm 8, how majestic is, is the world. Um, so let's go on now to look at the second type of life, which is um, realistic. So there is the ideal and the real. So you can get a vision in the first week of your studies, tertiary, that's the ideal. And then six months, 18 months on, there's the real. And you may feel you're in the real at the moment. And um, disorientation will often come. And so uh, Psalm 8 um, says, what are human beings that you are mindful of them, mortal, um, son of Adam, um, you're made a little lower, but... Um, God is able to uh, raise them uh, up. And so next week, we'll go on and look at the prophetic books. And in Isaiah, we see God's got a great dream for people. People don't often measure up to it. We looked at that a lot in um, uh, Genesis 3, didn't we? We spoke about evil. And so there is evil and uh, good. So God has given humans dominion over the works of his hands, um, Psalm 8, but not everyone's raising. And... Um, in Hebrews chapter 2, it tells us we don't see people ruling and reigning. Yeah. So any thoughts? How do you think um, uh, psalms that include disorientation are helpful? And so one example of a psalm of disorientation would be uh, Psalm 51. So if I go to Psalm 51 um, and uh, look at... Uh, this psalm of this. So here's, we've had positive psalms like Psalm 1, God's going to bless you. Um, you'll be like a tree planted by the river. Now, Psalm 51, have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your mercy, blot out my transgressions and wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, cleanse me from my sin. So that's orientation. God's going to bless you, wash you clean. Hang on, verse 3. I know my transgressions, my sin is before me. Well, better not stop there too long. Let's think about our sins. Now, the question can be raised. Traditional churches will often have quite a bit of time, in your Catholic church or whatever, where you can think upon what are the sins of this last week? Just bring them to God now, confess them and pray, 
and we're going to pray. Lord, we pray, bless everyone who brings their sins to you now. Now, if you go to a modern church, do you have that experience? Some people would say modern churches just begin with the positive, God's going to bless you, move on to the positive, God's going to bless you, and then preach a message, God's going to bless you. And so there is a question. The music thing, God will bless you even more. That's right, that's right. Particularly if you're tired of it. And so now, I guess the answer, I think, is both is that we need some of the ideas from the traditional church, whereby there's opportunity to say, if you've got trouble in your life, and I think fortunately most modern churches lot them have towards the end of the sermon, you know, some of you are carrying burdens now, we want you to lift them to God, Lord, we pray, deliver them. So I think modern churches probably do that. But we can ask, let's go along and ask, do you think there's enough space and time in our churches today for disorientation, pain, admitting suffering, um, and um, uh, confessing our sins. Yeah. yeah. I went to Hillsong a few years ago, and a lot of that was about um, working through hard times. Mm -hmm. yeah, a lot of it was majority of what spoken about in the talk. But at the same time, I often go to you know, church wherever I'm at, and there won't be much commitment to that. Yeah. It's all, they still talk about it, but not so much when I was like, I'm like, it's not so much if you've done this um, in the way to start to commit right now. It's more done yeah, yeah. So, so by way of contrast here we have a modern church hill song that actually gave practical advice on here's how to work through the hard times and here's opportunity to pray to give your problems to the lord and yet the traditional church it's meant to be the specialists in the hard times we're saying can talk about them but quickly at a surface level for five minutes and yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Thoughts? Yeah. Is there a, so the question is, is there enough time given for dealing with the sin challenges that we face, but also dealing with the disappointment and hurting challenges we face? Yep. You want to say no, that it's great. Okay, so it's more like a, um, Uh, self solve problems and something if you want to do the lifestyle or something. Mm. Um, and so it's a uh, problem that you need to do for it. Well, um, I don't actually think that's about actually what the human is part of being hard and going what's well, so actually um, what you need to do that is very different thing. Um, and so, what we say is, it's also a bit of a say, that is what we say is, more about what is by how is this uh, impacting us in a direct way, and so how we focus my and in that way, they have to uh, work through them, but then both have to overcome them, you say that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's good. And I what I like too is a number of you have mentioned, you've mentioned again, the practical solutions. So I think there are um, ideas, practical solutions there. Interestingly, that Walter Brueggemann draws his ideas from Paul Ricoeur, so he's the French phenomenologist that we've uh, looked at before. And uh, Paul Ricou, as a uh, French phenomenologist, has some uh, great insights. And we've said phenomenology can be uh, useful uh, here. So 
Phenomenology says that the reality of the phenomenon needs to be considered as it is. And so the reality of your life is not just the perfect dream of a life. There is difficulties in life. And so phenomenology admits the difficulties in life. The difficulty with phenomenology is that if you've got a poor phenomenology, it accepts the poor way things are described. And uh, cults can have a phenomenology that are entirely wrong. So phenomenology could really get it wrong. But I think if you've got a phenomenology that is grounded in that which is true and good um, and sound and solid, then it can be better than a more realist, a realism approach. And so um, we talked about romance before. So realism approach might mention the measure the hormones in my body, and I might say there are hormones in my bloodstream that are drawing me to this lovely person. Um, that's describing the realism of it, but it's not really the whole experience. The whole experience is I've got to get brave. I've got to talk to this person. I've got to buy the flowers, and yeah, you know, there's all sorts of things happening in the realism of the phenomenon. And so I think um, phenomenology is about reality as it is experienced as a phenomenon. The great thing for us as Christians that French Catholic phenomenologists are excited about is that it helps us talk about God in a realist way when the realists out there are saying, well, hang on, can you measure God? Can you weigh God, etc." So phenomenology is giving a way back into scholarship and universities for those who want to talk about God spoke to me this morning. God guided me this morning. And so Phenomenology for French philosophers has been found to be uh, useful. So, um, phenomenology, Paul Ricoeur is, um, uh, and also James K.A. Smith talks about these things a bit as well. So um, Psalm 145, I'll extol you, O God and King, I will bless you. So that's very positive. Um, songs of the law are very positive. If you obey the law, you'll get blessed. Uh, wisdom, like Psalms 14 and 37, God's going to bless you if you do the right thing in life. And Psalm 131 and 133, the steadfast good, goodness of the Lord is present and real. So you can have a blessed life. So the orientation message is correct. God can bless you. And you should go out of here positive. God is there. The sun has risen, uh, unless it's about five minutes till sunset. And you're going to have a great day. However. The disorientation approach says that often people in life at some stage are going to face disorienting events. You could have an accident. Things could, um, you could have a tragedy. So things may not go so well in life. And Walter Brueggemann says a lot of the Psalms are about disorientation. Um, the church often sings the positive and the prosperity gospel, but it's also good to affirm difficulty. And I think good preaching in churches is where the minister says, these are the challenges that I face. And I think that's what um, uh, we hear a lot of, the people being real and authentic. That's what we uh, want. One of the things about disorientation is that we don't pretend the world is different to what it is. It also demands that we not withhold anything from God. We're open, we're transparent, and we're honest. And we provide a safe space for everyone to talk about all of their feelings. The important thing is that there needs to be a reorientation afterwards. And so reorientation is where we come back to the real. Um, so the third movement is reorientation. So after you've poured out your woes, and if we had time in pairs, you could talk to one another about the woes in your life. But let's move on to the reorientation where things won't go back to the way they were but you'll mature and you grow. So it's not simply a return to the old order, the, and then you'd have to go through the disorientation again. Rather, uh, it's moving on to the bigger world and bigger picture that God has for us. It's not just a natural solution or outcome. It's a transformation, and it's about the bigger world in which God exists. It includes personal thanksgiving. So we thank God, even though we go through problems in life and we experience real distress and pain. And really, the orientation, disorientation, reorientation is the Jesus message of the gospel. Jesus proclaims God's good news. They take Jesus to the cross. And we've got to ask a lot of questions. How can you crucify the son of God? But three days later, God raises him, and now we have a reorientation, this new world with the resurrected Jesus. That's the gospel message. 
Communal thanksgiving gives uh, thanksgiving for the salvation um, that is coming. So it's both present and future. And next week, when we look at the prophets, they're saying that there are better times coming, but sometimes you got to believe that when you go through the tough times. Um, sometimes there are psalms that focus on kingship and rulership, which could look to God and uh, Jesus. And uh, sometimes, um, like the book of Exodus, we're not fully there. We're on a journey towards the better world. Um, so some brief thoughts um, on what do you think of this message of orientation, reorientation? So it's orientation, disorientation, reorientation. Thoughts? Yeah, I'm mulling it over. <laughs> yep. One is for that new community um, You know, okay, it's a bit of a long thought. So I chose the good news, the the one about blessed is the man who dashes your baby and you get the cross. Yeah. So I heard that speaking to you. Can you look at that? God's called baby, mm. you know, mm. supports God, it's just a very vague where I think, like, um, you know, obviously that's not God speaking, that's mm. um, speaking a to God. You know, they've been taking the service, you know, their own child. Mm. And so it's very much about demonstrating someone, you know, Thank God, which is um, what you mentioned before about being um, really designed to be open with God. Like, I think it can be very real to, you know, close yourself off to praying to God when you're on fire. Mm -hmm. You've done something that's good about, like, to, like, on your end, close off that communication there and not have that answer. And I think, well, why did God allow that to be put in the Bible? You know, why not just make all the happy go lucky stuff? Mm. You know, but I think, I think it is the key part of this message that, you know, in Christian yeah, that's brilliant. Appreciate that. Kayla, what are your thoughts on this message of orientation, disorientation, reorientation that Walter Brueggemann is, is telling us about being present in the Bible and present in the Psalms? I think, um, I guess, like for me with my essay, I've been looking a little bit at the idea of redemption and you can sort of see that pattern even in the three. So there's the orientation at the start and then there's not necessarily a falling away, but there's a problem or a challenge in the disorientation. And then there's a coming back in the, in the reorientation. So there's mm. kind of a similar pattern, but it's that... Um, yeah, acknowledging the, the problem or the calling out for assistance and then reorientating with, but still, you know, giving thanks to God or praising or acknowledging reasons why you have hope or trust in him. Yeah, that's brilliant. And that's the prodigal son, isn't it? Parents bless, children drift away, but there's a welcome back as well. And so we see that uh, message in uh, many of the Psalms. So I'll close the internet down and we'll start um, in uh, three or four minutes again. Thank you.